One of the hardest things for any Christian to do is to become a disciple of Jesus. You see, God calls many. Many are called. Everyone in the world literally is called to come unto him. Jesus has already called out to the world for salvation. And he said, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come, the spirit of the bride said, come, as it says in the book of Revelation. But while many are called, that doesn't mean that everyone is going to come to salvation. Not everyone is going to take that step of faith to begin to come to a comprehension and a knowledge of God himself, to experience salvation from their sins. They may be delivered at some temporary time from some of their experiences, but that doesn't mean that they continue on with God. So you see lots of times, lots of people become very religious for a while. They become very observant of the religious ritual of walking with God up to a point. You see, they will come in, as Jesus has said, to come, and they will go forward in some type of ceremony and make a declaration of faith in God so that they believe that they are of God but what they choose to do with God determines their salvation because it is not enough to simply make a declaration before everyone in the congregation that, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian, I, 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 I'm saved, I'm, I'm born again. But the reality is that what you do with God determines whether you are obedient with him and you know him and you obey or whether you go against what he's been telling you to do in stopping from your own sins or your own selfishness or your own desires or your own will and going your own way. In other words, it boils down to really a relationship. Do you have a personal relationship with God? If you don't, then you can obviously get away with just sitting someplace and acting out the part of being a Christian. But the person who wants to pursue God, who wants to find God in everything that he does, in every way that God reveals himself, then that person goes beyond that measure of faith that says, oh, well, I'm going to go forward because I feel like it, and everyone tells me I should do this in order to be spared from hell. Rather, that person says, hey, you know what? I don't want to be religious. You know, I don't, I don't believe in this philosophy of religion. I want to know if there really is a God. I want to pursue this to the utmost. I want to go all the way so that I can discover whether God is real. And then if he is, I want to know some answers to my questions because I don't understand some of the things that are going on. Why do we have all these wars and rumors of war? Why do we have these situations and circumstances? Why has these things happened in my life? When a person is willing to go to the utmost, then I say to them, good. Make it real. Get down and dirty with it. Get real with God. Ask Him. Seek Him. Find Him. Don't just be settled with these platonic answers that are generically organized in order to pacify the masses, but rather seek with all your heart to know the answer for yourself of what God wants you to know personally and intimately from Himself. Because that is why Jesus chose disciples from followers. Many of the masses followed Jesus for quite a few times. He would be out in the wilderness and there would be thousands that would come to him and they would eagerly await to hear what he had to say, but they also wanted to see if he would do something. What would he do this time? Would he raise the dead? Would he heal the sick? Would he cast out demons? So they were excited. They would come running forward to Jesus and say, Oh, and then as soon as they met him, they were awestruck. They were taken back by how ordinary, seemingly, he was. He was an ordinary man. He didn't appear as though he had a hate. He didn't look like he glowed. He didn't look like he was full of smiles all the time. In fact, there was such a calmness about him that that, frankly, took people back because he was calm. He was the Prince of Peace. He was the manifestation of peace itself. And as a son of man, he was normal. And yet, he was able to do those things that God directed him to do because God had already prepared the way before him. So, when the people came to him, they wanted to see what would happen. 
They wanted to discover what was different about this man, who seemed to be like every other man, except he healed the sick, he raised the dead. He seemed to have this ability that he conferred unto his disciples and sent them out, some of his followers, the 70, and they had done miracles and they declared that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. So they came out to hear the message, but they came out more to see the miracles. So when they saw miracles, they were amazed. When they were fed, they were dumbfounded because he had compassion on the crowds. He fed them with bread that he didn't own. He fed them with fishes that were donated that he multiplied into being enough to feed thousands. They were shocked. And when they went away satisfied, they thought about his message because they were fed, they were filled, they had gotten what they wanted. They had gotten a message. They had gotten food and shelter. They had been taken care of. Well, one day there came a time when Jesus said, look, I know why you've come. And suddenly the people that were following after Jesus, that looked to him for a message, that looked to him for food, that looked to him for miracles, that wanted to see what he might do, were shocked by the reality of God confronting them where they were at. God getting personal in their life. God getting real to them personally, each one individually, and saying, I know why you're here. You only come to see the miracles. You are only here to be fed. You're only here to be filled. I say unto you, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And after this time, they were shocked. What in the world is he saying? We don't understand. And because they didn't understand, because they had not thought about, they had not considered about, they didn't even come back to question him. They listened and walked away. And he said to them, why are you amazed that I say that? I am the bread that comes down from heaven. He that eats of me will never hunger. They didn't bother wanting to know the answer. They didn't ask to be explained to. They didn't want to know the truth. They wanted to see what they wanted to see. They wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. They wanted to see miracles. He didn't give them a miracle. They wanted to be fed. He didn't feed them. They wanted to be given a message. He brought confrontation. The reality was he told them where they were at because they were only following him for those reasons. And they were shocked that he knew. So when he confronted them at a point in time, his disciples had to make a decision. Would they seek to follow him as he had begun to explain some of his message to them? Or would they choose to go away? as the followers do. And in John 6, 66, which is always interesting, John 6, 6, 6, it says that many quit following. The utmost that we can do is to always seek to know the Lord and to go to Him for our answers, not to be going to Him for miracles, because if you're going to God for a miracle, go away. You can find miracle workers all around you, and according to your faith, you'll probably be healed. You can find people that can feed you. You know, you can go to the government. You can go to churches. You can go to other socialized events that will provide for you. Even God himself will in some ways have mercy upon you and give you provision. And you can go that way and be a follower of God or of Jesus. But the question will always be, if you want to see raising the dead and you want to have all these things, then you really can't be his disciple go away and just be a follower. Because to be the utmost, to desire to know God in this intimate and personal way that we're desiring to know Him, in the to follow Him, means you have to deny yourself. You will have to lay down your life for the brethren. You will have to walk with Jesus to the cross. And you will have to crawl up on there and die to your own desires. Because uh, most videos is to prepare you for death. The cost of Christianity, the cost of discipleship was once written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer as Jesus doesn't bid you to come and live, he bids you to come and die. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer in that cost of discipleship described a very intimate way with which we have to give up what we want in order to do what God says. And we cannot look at another. We cannot look to the left or the right. We have to be spot on 
to look right at Jesus in the eye when he says, come and follow me. So in utmost to utmost videos, we use utmost first highest because that does challenge us where we're at. It is a attack to the heart of the matter where we're living today, where we're existing and being. Are we owning up to our own failure, our own evil desires, our own wants, our own needs, our own selfishness, our own selves? I can't answer that for you. I can't tell you where you're at. I can tell you where I'm at. And yes, God, I am selfish. Yes, God, I do have evil desires. Yes, God, I need you to speak to me directly, to show me personally, to walk with me intimately, to cause me, even in my failings, to be restored when I fail you and fall. But you've called me and you've chosen me and you've directed me to be your disciple. Bring me now into your presence that I might be your witness, even to this generation that we live in. If you are not up to the task, go and learn, go and be, go and enjoy the blessings that many people will give you in a dynamic personal Bible study that you can learn anywhere else. Please don't be a disciple because it will cost you your life. Please don't try to follow Jesus in a more intimate, personal way because it might cost you your wife, it might cost you your children, it might cost you your job, it might cost you all these things in order that you might apprehend what is the fullness of God Almighty in you. But it will cost you. So we are warned, we are exhorted, we are told, we are reminded to count the cost because Jesus said it no man no man when he goes into battle doesn't sit down and first say look at the enemy before me look at how many there are and then he examines his own resources and says but who before us and how few there be of us and doesn't weigh the cost and determine what the outcome will be as Jesus said, I have told you before and I will tell you again, it will cost you your life. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. If they have persecuted the master, will they not likewise do so unto you? But I have prayed for you, Peter, that after you have been tried and sifted as sand, you would strengthen your brethren. What would you be? And I do not know. But if you would do your utmost for God's highest, then purchase, find, get one of these books, read it, do it, experience it, watch the videos with us, spend a year going forward to be able to lay down your life when the time comes for many others that would come unto Jesus and find salvation. For that's what it's all about. It's about knowing him, which is his will for us, but it's about growing in others the knowledge of Jesus himself, that they might find salvation. And Father, I pray not only for them that hear my words, but I pray that through their words, others might be saved. And so Jesus prayed, and so my heart reaches out to you to say the same. Would you not know to be even likened unto what Jesus prayed? in his prayer for his disciples. Read it, live it, do it. Deserter or disciple? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. John 6, 66. When God by his spirit through his word gives you a clear vision of his will, you must walk in the light of that vision. 1 John 1, 7. Think about what each word says. Think about each principle that is read when you read it for yourself at home. Think about what you're reading and then do it. It's not enough to be hearing it. If you are a disciple, you can't just hear. You'll desert, you'll leave, you'll quit, you'll change, you'll rearrange, you'll make excuses. This is saying something specific to you. This is from God 
to you and me. When God, by his spirit, through his word, God is the one speaking. He's doing it through the Holy Spirit and he's doing it through his word. So when you get it, when you have proven it, when you know it, when you are determined that that vision that God has given for you of his will is yours, then you do it. That's what you have to do. You can't change it. You can't rearrange it. You can't back out of it. You can't make excuses. You have to go forward because if you don't, you're not his disciple. You cannot deny once you have stated that his vision is for you, that it's his choice, that he wants you to do this, then go forward with it. And whatever the outcome is, is his determination, not yours. You are just to obey, which is better than sacrifice. Yours is to hear and to listen and to be a witness of obedience unto him. Even though your mind and soul may be thrilled by it, if you don't walk in the light of it, you will sink to a level of bondage never envisioned by your Lord. If you don't do, no matter how good or how bad it is, you will be chained, as it were, from walking with him from that day on and dragged off by your own declarations and statements. Mentally disobeying the heavenly vision and Acts 26, 19 will make you a slave to ideas and views that are not completely foreign. It will make you a slave to ideas and views that are completely foreign to Jesus Christ. If God has told you to do something, then do it. You can't do what I am doing. If God tells you to do what I do, then God is the one leading you. But if you're doing what I'm doing by being an imitator of me, you are a poor imitation of what you think you're supposed to be, which is Christ-likeness. You are called to do what God has told you to do and to stick with that. You don't make yourself to be out like someone else. You do what God has given you a vision for, what God has purposed in your heart to do, what God has spoken to you, what he has revealed in his word to you. That's what makes you a disciple. Not because you look like another disciple, but because you are a follower of Jesus himself one on one. Don't look at someone else and say, well, if he can have those views and prosper, why can't I? God may choose to use you in a way that causes you to be impoverished from the day you start being his disciple to the day you finish being his disciple. He may choose for you to be wealthy beyond measure or he may choose for you to be up and down. It is not for you to determine your own course and destiny. It is God who is at work in you to do into will of his good pleasure. You are not called to make your own choices. You are called to ask him what his will is for you and then follow it as he reveals it to you. Then you will learn from it as he is explaining it to you in his will, his way, his word. Well, if he can have those views and prosper, why can't I? You have to walk in the light of the vision that he has given to you, not to the other person. Don't compare yourself with others or don't judge them. That is between God and them. You are not called to be a disciple of disciples. You are not an apostle of apostles. You are not a teacher of teachers. You are not an elder of elders. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ himself and if God has made you a teacher of teachers and it's God who's teaching them you are not the teacher if it is God who's made you an apostle of apostles then God is the pointer and he is the chief head of all apostles and he will teach you and guide you in whatever it is that you're called to do if you are a prophet of prophets then God has made you a servant of the most high it is not you that does it the recognition is that you cannot be another judge of judgers because God has reserved judgment unto the Son of Man, the Son of God, and for him alone to judge, and he shall. When you find that one of your favorite and strongly held views clashes with your heavenly vision, do not begin to debate it. If you do, a sense of property and personal right will emerge in you, things on which Jesus placed no value. He was against these things as being the root of everything foreign to himself. 
For one's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses in Luke 12, 15. If we don't see and understand this, it is because we are ignoring the underlying principles of our Lord's teaching. Everyone has misconceptions. Everyone has false ideas. Everyone has pet theories that they want to be true, that they hope might be possible, that they really seek to understand in a way that fits for themselves, but doesn't necessarily fit what God has said he wants you to do. Keep them to yourself. They are pet ideas. They are just things that while you were in the sandbox of your understanding, while you were playing with your toys and joys, you were heading in a certain direction that God used for that purpose. But they are not according to His will. You should always obey and walk and seek to do His will in His way as He leads you and as He guides you. Our tendency is to lie back and bask in the memory of the wonderful experience we had when God revealed his will to us. But if a New Testament standard is revealed to us by the light of God and we don't try to measure up or even feel inclined to do so, then we begin to backslide. As God proceeds in training you and teaching you and leading you as a disciple of his, then he's going to reveal to you things that you don't know were wrong when you first began. When you first started off in one area, you may have thought you knew the truth. And then he reveals to you how odd it is once you move into another area. That is how God disciples all of us. He teaches us according to the preparation of the time and place that we need to have it for the revelation of himself to other people. So you will have to be constantly adaptable, teachable, malleable, changeable to be made into his image so that you understand how his spirit works as he begins to reveal to you new understanding of a truth that has been there all along, but now you begin to comprehend it to you personally so that you can apply it to those around you corporately so that he is always changing and rearranging the things in your life to make them fit to your life. It means your conscience does not respond to the truth. You can never feel or never be the same after unveiling of the truth. It will confront you. It will be a fact. And until you accept it, it will not be a reality until you have dealt with it. That moment marks you as one who either continues on with Jesus, with even more devotion as a disciple of Christ, or as one who turns to go back as a deserter. God will confront all of our false ideas and place them in the fulcrum of his own reality of who he is. Anything that conflicts with the revelation of Jesus Christ himself is going to be confronted by his spirit. And his spirit is truth. So when he does, he is going to show you in some way that you must immediately let God reveal it to you. Don't fight it except what God is teaching you. He wants to show you the truth. He wants to make you understand himself in it. If you do not do as he reveals it to you, you will fall away from him in a personal way and begin to misunderstand who Jesus is. You always must yield to the Spirit of God as he reveals to you some truth and some aspect of God that you did not really have a proper understanding of before. But now that you've walked with him and talked with him, you begin to have an awareness of his presence, showing you a new way of looking at him that you never understood. You have to let go of your life. You have to let go of your understanding. You have to be challenged to the very core of your being daily, or else you really aren't one of these disciples. It has to stretch you. It has to change you. It has to rearrange you. It has to be your utmost in order to accomplish the uttermost that you want for him to be his highest for you, always in the forefront of your mind, your heart, and your desire. For if you would go on and be his disciple and not fall away, he will call you today to come and be like him. Not just carrying your cross, but dying.